Hello, everyone. I'm here with Kevin Gastola. He is he runs Shadowproof. Uh, he's an American journalist, and this is his niche area: whistleblowers and free press issues. So, thanks so much, Kevin, for joining me. Obviously, um, this is a pretty big whistleblower case, Daniel Hale, that is just um, concluded. Um, but we want to go back to the beginning. But take us back to the beginning. Uh, so, so tell us what's going on. What happened with Daniel Hale? Yes. So in 2009, he joins the military, uh, the U.S. Air Force, for reasons that are quite common in the United States. Young people who do not have money and resources and are not sure how they're going to start their lives as adults. Uh, they perhaps can't afford college or going to university without sustaining and, and taking on a lot of student loan debt. So they go to the military and join. It's a poverty draft. And he enlisted. And it's important to say he didn't enlist because he was like, rah, rah, patriot. I want to go kill terrorists abroad. He joined because he was hoping to be in a better position after he was done in the Air Force so that he could have um, a future um, that where he wasn't as poor. And so he was deployed to Afghanistan. Uh, he was part of a, a Joint Special Operations Command team over in Afghanistan. And what his task was as a signal intelligence analyst was to do geolocation of targets by tracking their cell phone devices or using metadata. And uh, part of his disclosures in the documents he revealed shine a light on this process and how it could be extremely faulty and that you weren't always killing the people you were supposedly targeting. In any case, while he's over there, he, uh, he wrote about this in his very profound letter to Judge Liam O'Grady in the Eastern District of Virginia. And it, he recalls the gruesome violence he witnessed, the, the strikes that were carried out while he was there in Afghanistan. He, he, he highlights a few particular examples. And so it's clear that it, it extremely bothered him. He returns in 2013, he's honorably discharged. He has a security clearance and he's able to become a contractor for any top security company who would have him, which allows him to make somewhere around $80,000 a year. And that's the kind of salary that is appealing. However, he is conflicted. He, he doesn't believe he should be cashing in on what he has done overseas. And yet, you know, there are people who have gone to college and graduated, as he mentions, who aren't able to make salaries that are that good. So he takes his job. He says he's only going to be there for six months as a contractor for a firm called Lados, Lidos. And he goes to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, a very little known agency, but one that's involved in mapping. And he is there. He didn't know he was going to have access to classified information, although the US claims differently without any evidence whatsoever. But he joins and he has access to these databases. But he's not, you know, really planning, according to him. He didn't prepare to make this step and go to a reporter with documents until he had this moment while he was working where colleagues pulled him uh, or invited him to go after work with them, sit with them after work and watch archived footage of drone strikes for their own amusement. And wow. this did not sit well with him. He says this is war porn and it probably brought him back to being in his facility where at Bagram Air Base was where he was stationed, this notorious air base in Afghanistan. He was stationed there. He probably recalled being 
at Bagram and thought, you know, I'm not going to go back to this. I know that this is wrong. I know that this is not something for our entertainment. And he realized he's got to do something. So he, he said he could no longer be a party to this anymore. And he had to make a sacrifice. So he contacted journalist Jeremy Scahill, who at the time was a foremost journalist working on drones with his Dirty Wars project. Uh, the film that he produced was nominated for an Oscar. And uh, of course, he was in the media having founded The Intercept and being connected to Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras for working on Edward Snowden's documents. All right. And I'll just take it from there. So at this point, we have a movie clip from Laura Poitras's documentary um, where um, Glenn Greenwald and Ed Snowden are first here. Well, Glenn is sharing the, this, the knowledge of this new leak from Hale um, about the secret drone program. And I just, everyone, so not that many people are familiar with Hale. I'm, it's good to see uh, people certainly know who Ed Snowden is. And, it's, and I'm happy to say it see, sure seems like people have finally recognized and continue to recognize more and more people see that Snowden's actions were commendable. They were the right thing to do. Our government was lying to us um, about a massive spy network, unconstitutional spy network, massive surveillance program. And just look at how Snowden reacts to these revolutions, uh, revelations from Hale everyone. All right. So this really puts things in perspective, I think. All, yeah. So the update that I want to give you is about the new, um, the new source. And now, and then like basically what's happened is, and that's actually, that's really dangerous. Um, on the sources side, there's a there's a chart. You know, it's, there's like a whole layout in it for everyone. Yeah, it's really bold. It's really risky. But you know that that's the thing. If, if more, they I mean, understand I, what they're uh, doing, there's this chart. It goes like this. It shows the decision making chart. It's a chart that it's 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 shaped like this. So up here it says. Mm -hmm. That's the decision making chart for each one. So, Kevin, what are we looking at there? Oh, no, you, you're, we're, you're, yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're looking at so some arrows that lead to POTUS, uh, to, to the president of the United States. Yeah, you can see that. It's very clear. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the drone that. program sh showing that. Go ahead. It goes all the way up to the president. I presume that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's the that's 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 what it's being sketched out there. Um, but that's you know that's one paper. I don't know what exactly Edward was shown. We don't really we see, see that. We well there there's another good one. I know this came out a while, but we're, I'm going to play it because there's another incorrect like one really big uh, revelation. Glenn shares with Snowden. I'll play it. And maybe if you have other. Um, uh, a mic yeah, well, or you, earbuds you could switch out? Yeah, I was going to um, privately tell you that okay. um, if you pull my screen down while you show this next clip, I'll I'll, I'll go get up and, and fix that. So. All right, great. Cool. And and it's so political. This is, this part's amazing. That's that's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> this is, it's so shocking. <laughs> that's no, that's I know. the population. I know. So what is Snowden reacting to there? The note says there are 1.2 million people on various stages of this terrorist watch list this list of potential uh, targets to kill 
with this drone assassination program. Pretty amazing. That's and as Snowden says, goes on to say, <laughs> that's a bit more than some countries. <laughs> we have a kill list the size of country of countries. Oh man, or watch lists that of potential uh, targets for killing. Of entire country. I know. That's what we're working on. Look at this. <laughs> That's just. I, I just can't get over how like Snowden is just dumbfounded. This is a man who, you know, saw that our entire government was lying to us about that massive surveillance network spying on his own citizens. And um, and he calls da Daniel Hale bold. Now that's saying something. And he's calling these revelations that Daniel Hale um, blew the whistle on or revealed to the intercept. He's calling that epic. I mean, just to put things in perspective for people who are familiar with the Snowden story, but not Hale. Um, and I'll bring it back to uh, Kevin for comment. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's, he's obviously shocked at what's being said, but uh, I'll, I'll also add my own commentary, which can be taken positively or negatively, but I'm not actually trying to I'm trying to start something with Glenn Greenwald. I'm just going <laughs> to say, though, that in a film where you do that and include that scene in your documentary, uh, you are tipping off the government that you have a source for a major story, which is going to lead people who investigate leaks and do counterintelligence and are in the business of repressing people who speak out that's going to lead them to begin looking for who this person could be. Uh, so uh, am I saying that they put a target on Daniel Hale's back? Somewhat. Daniel Hale makes some decisions that put him in a vulnerable position, but, you know, ultimately this is a, this is a choice that is made professionally that in retrospect you can question. Um, yeah, no, that's fair to say, but uh, just so people know, this film came out in 2014, I believe the end of 2014 in Scahill's um, articles with Hale's revelations came out in 2015. Right. Uh, right. So, so there's not too much of a so, timeline, too not time difference between when the film was dropped and the Intercept articles came out, right? Yeah, yeah. So I get your point because they're not going to learn from this documentary that Daniel Hale is a source. They would have already known at that point that his home has already been raided. So that is a good point. Um, I just think that... Uh, it's a good thing that nobody else was watching that hotel room at the time and that you had this fugitive in the hotel room with you who they were all looking for. It's a good thing that when you filmed that clip that nobody was able to see or hear what you were doing. Um, and actually, we don't honestly know if I mean, we presume that nobody was eavesdropping because Edward Snowden was able to get away from Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, you don't know. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so the, you uh, know what I, I'll just say, no, I think that's totally uh, f fair uh, points. You know, you want to be cautious as hell in this kind of situation. Snowden is obviously nervous as hell. even Snowden is nervous. As hell. But I think it's because Snowden is ex an expert in this kind of stuff, super paranoid about being safe in these kind of situations and with this kind of material that made perhaps Glenn, you know, felt confident enough to, to discuss it because, you know, S Snowden had scooped out everything out, uh, you, you know, making sure that they were as safe as could be in this H Hong Kong hotel. But um, no, I mean, you, you never you never know. It, it, you never know. 
it, it, it's possible, but you know, at, at the time, um, another thing is that uh, Daniel Hale hasn't been indicted. So at this, uh, whether he's under investigation or not, uh, there could be something to where um, they're not able to, um, you know, put together a case or whatever. And so I don't, I know I, I wouldn't have wanted this film to contribute to the U S justice department. Anyways, I made my point. Yeah. Um, I, okay. Uh, I, I don't need to keep going. Yeah. Point appreciated. Okay. And now, so this was before, um, Hmm. Let's see. Well, I'm now I'm going to take it to a little clip so, at a Code uh, Pink I'm... event. And this is probably maybe one of, if not the first public appearance of Daniel Hale. Yeah, he um, says that. And the other thing people should consider as they watch this clip is this is right at the time in his life when he is struggling with his conscience and trying to figure out what to do. He hasn't made the decision to give documents to Jeremy Scahill yet, but he's thinking, he's thinking about what he's going to do as someone who you can see his shirt. He's, he's here as a member of Iraq vets against the war, Iraq veterans against the war. And, uh, um, okay. Yes. So, and he's got a Chelsea Manning pin on, you can see that on his shirt. He's so, a I mean, of Chelsea yeah, Manning. that, that's a signal uh, for sh Yeah. Um, so he's being rather bold just wearing that at this event and talking about these subjects. You know, I, I think it's safe to say. Um, okay. So here we go. Here's, I think this makes clear that his intentions are pure, this clip, because he's not looking for any kind of applause. So uh, I'm going to be saying some stuff and there might be like a knee jerk reaction to clap or just because it's, you know, a crowd of people here. I just want if everybody would please to, uh, you know, resist that urge and just understand that, uh, you know, nothing that I'm going to be talking about is really clap worthy. But um, uh, understandably, I'm pretty nervous. This is my second time doing this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I failed public speaking in college, which was about... <laughs> It's about as much college as I got. So, uh, and before I begin, uh, one last thing. I just would like to, uh, in a way, say I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not up here for any good reasons. Uh, and to the people in the audience who uh, are victims or who are families of victims or have families who live in countries uh, where U.S. militarism and specifically uh, unmanned systems are conducting uh, kinetic strikes. Uh, I, I'm sorry uh, because I'm up here because I was for a time, a short period of time during my military uh, career uh, as a, uh, an analyst working with uh, unmanned systems deployed to Afghanistan. Um, and at the very least, you all deserve an apology. But. Um, it's, uh, anyway, no, no, it's, thank you, but it's, it's, uh, it's okay. I'm sorry. It's a little, um, it's okay. Uh, so, I mean, to me, that's like, it, it just, it just, it's so obvious. He's, he's not interested in any kind of glory. He just wants to do the right thing. And it's kind of the opposite, the exact opposite There's of the, exact the uh, of, 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 of how people are, uh, well, the government is trying to, frame him and it's i was also going to say the exact opposite of jeb bush the jeb bush please clap it's like <laughs> it's 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 still kind of cringe but you know it, he's so pure um and it's please don't clap um what, yes. what you want to comment on it and you yeah in several of the uh, among several of the character attacks that were leveled against him over the course of this political prosecution. One of them that I imagine came from the mind of Gordon Cromberg, who is a notorious, should be a more notorious attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, but he's known for promoting Islamophobia through his cases. He's known for going out front 
on these cases that are controversial, that career bureaucrats probably would like to keep a distance from. And he says, in this case, you know, he puts his name to this in, in this filing. He says that Daniel Hale is out for self-aggrandizement. And in a part of the filing for the sentencing document where they are arguing that Daniel Hale should get nine years in prison, nine to 11 years. He didn't, he was not sentenced to nine. He received 45 months. So the U S government didn't get what they wanted for Gordon Cromberg and the U S attorney's office in this district did not get what they wanted. But in this section, they're saying without any evidence whatsoever that Daniel Hale ingratiated himself with journalists. He looked up to them like they were rock stars. He wanted to be one of them. They pull this yeah. message no evidence out of, of that context. Whatsoever. <laughs> they pull a message out of context suggesting that he, he would like to do this so he could have great sex. It's absurd. It, if not, if, and also vile, but there isn't any evidence at all to support this. They never have to prove that this is how he acted, but also we know that this isn't true uh, because over the time that he had between being raided and indicted, he never once seriously pursues journalism as a way to challenge being prosecuted by the government. So that's the first train of logic I think we should have in order for you to argue that someone wants to become a rock star journalist wants to use their whistleblowing to catapult them into the public eye and to gain a, a, a stellar reputation you would have to show that this person was publishing a blog or yeah at the very uh, least or yeah. at the very least show me his youtube channel is he maybe he would be doing regular streams or maybe he'd have an Instagram where he's talking to some followers on a regular basis. There's none of that. He's, he doesn't have that much of a presence in between the time that he has this cloud hanging over his head that was not removed by the Obama Justice Department, even though they didn't charge him officially. And so uh, you, you then, then he's indicted and he sinks deeper into despair. He doesn't want to defend himself in the press. And I encourage people to go read the New York Magazine story that is out there. This feature that dropped a couple weeks, within a couple weeks before he had his sentencing date. And it's under the headline, Call Me a Traitor. Because powerfully, he thinks that he should be prideful that he betrayed his government because he was part of a killing machine and he should not, you know, you should not be proud to be part of the targeted assassination complex. You should want to betray a country that is perpetuating this kind of warfare. Um, and so, you know, there's an intervention that is highlighted in this feature story that his friends and people who are very close to him, who are living with him, like roommates, have to perform where they get him to go to a tavern and they tell him it's time. This is December, 2020. They say it's time. You have to speak out. You need to go to a journalist and tell your side of the story. Otherwise, prosecutors are going to continue to have their way with the media. And all of these character attacks are going to be out there about you. And you need to do something about this. I'm paraphrasing. I wasn't present at the meeting, but this is essentially what is in the New York Magazine story, that you need to do something to challenge what the prosecutors are saying about you. And he says, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then it isn't until April of this year, April 2021, that he does reach out to Carrie Holly at New York Magazine and, and, and share what his side of the story is to some degree. Uh, but not extensively. I mean, the first time we really get his side is in this letter to the judge. 
which is within the court process of being prosecuted. And then he gives a statement that's a little more than 15 minutes during his sentencing hearing. So within being prosecuted, he's speaking out. Outside of court, he isn't speaking out. He's not trying to litigate his case in the public. And so there's no evidence at all that he's out to like inflate his ego or do this for self-aggrandizement. Um, in fact, as is evident in that clip where he apologizes to people who are present in the audience, one man there's uh, Faisal Ali, uh, sorry, Faisal bin Ali Jaber, who's a Yemen civil engineer who actually brought a case in the United States, a civil lawsuit against the U.S. government because he has relatives who were assassinated um, and they were they, they, they died in this, this drone strike. Uh, I don't know if they were the targets. I don't believe they were the targets, but um, he had people in his family. One's a police officer. Uh, the other was a preacher who was actually trying to help troubled young men not join Islamic extremist groups. And they were killed in this drone strike. And so uh, this was a strike that Daniel Hale witnessed and observed while he was deployed to Afghanistan. I mean, this happened in Yemen, but they had access to the video and were able to watch it unfold. He said he put this in his letter to the judge. And so at this summit that you played, the clip that you played, when he's apologizing, he's apologizing to a man who he saw his relatives get vaporized while he was in Afghanistan. Yeah. Let, can you tell us, so, so then he sees, so he has this change of heart after being a, you know, loyal soldier for several years, um, believing in what he was doing. What did he go on to, to leak? What are some of the big bombshells, you know, no pun intended about that about, uh, 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 on the drone strikes on the drone strike program that he revealed. So let me start with something that's not from the drone program because he actually made quite an impact according to uh, CARE, which is a, a very uh, large Muslim civil rights organization in the United States. Uh, he released a watch listing gui guidance document that showed how people end up on the watch list, the, t the terrorism watch list. And that terrorism watch list or the database that has this watch listing of people, it filters into the no-fly list. And there are cases that have been brought throughout the last 10 years, particularly by this group, CARE, and other civil liberties organizations that have fought to have people removed from the no-fly list because they were on there and they're peaceful civilians and they should not be on that no-fly list. They're not connected to anybody accused of terrorism and yet they were placed on the no-fly list and they had no recourse to get off of it. They were deprived of their liberty and their, their, their right to travel. And so this document was referenced by these organizations is something that helped them win their cases against uh, against the government that you know didn't want to have any oversight or have the judge do anything to disrupt the way that they do this no fly list and watch listing, and so that's a big deal. Um, people have actually gotten off the no fly list because of this document. That's what these organizations say. That's that's huge. To the drone program, the U.S. military's drone program, he says that um, around nine out of ten people who the government it was striking were not terrorism suspects. You know, were not people who should be who you would think would be targeting. Jesus um, Christ! And he said in his letter to the judge that. Part of his whistleblowing was to challenge President Barack Obama, who was making statements that were false or entirely incomplete about the program. And so he's speaking, and Daniel can see on the inside that that's not how it works. So he's saying that people who are killed are imminent threats to 
the United States. And he knows as someone involved, that's not the standard. In fact, he points to a, a much lower and vague standard of they just have to be said to pose a threat to U.S. interests, whatever that means. Yeah. I'm sure you could fabricate whatever you want to claim someone on the ground in Afghanistan who you probably know very little about and you don't know a whole lot about their associations. You're just believing what you got from warlords or um, informants on the ground, uh, people who have, you know, there's this whole history in Afghanistan of people who have ulterior motives who are turning in people for uh, capture or to be killed. And some of the men who ended up at Guantanamo Bay ended up there as prisoners because they had, uh, I guess you could call them rivals that sold them out to the U.S. government. You know, so this is what could happen with the drone program. People get killed who are not involved in terrorism, but get singled out by people who are trying to maintain their territory or trying to maintain their power over certain parts of Afghanistan. It's just a fact. Um, or people will do it out of self-interest. Maybe they get picked up by the United States government and they give up a name so that they can go free and be uh, and, and ensure that they aren't going to be abused. And so this is how people end up having their names put on lists. It's extremely flawed. Uh, so this is something that was was part of what um, Daniel Hale exposed. And you know he's calling attention to this method of geolocation that is done. Uh, his, one of the documents, goes into detail very technically about how that geolocation is done, but pointing to something that I think is probably fairly obvious to anyone who thinks about what could happen if you're going to target someone based on their cell phone. What if you don't have that cell phone on you when that Hellfire mm -hmm. missile is fired? Or if someone else has it. <laughs> what if, yeah, what if a family member has your cell phone? Or what if it's just in your house and you're not home with your cell phone? What if you left to go somewhere down the street and you didn't take your phone with you? Who are they going to kill? They're not going to kill the person who they intend. So this and, and the metadata and, and, and all of this, it's not foolproof either. And so um, these are some of the things, you know, in addition to stories about the way the government was waging uh, they call them small footprint operations in the Horn of Africa, in places like Somalia, which uh, if you would like just a moment of, of, of levity, uh, I understand from people who were in attendance at the sentencing hearing, the judge actually referred to the Horn of Africa and the prosecutors grew apoplectic and were losing their mind and had him turn on the hiss machine so that they could go to the side while the public was still there and court had not been um, sent into a closed session, but they were claiming to the judge that classified information had just been violated because they said the words horn of Africa. <laughs> and, and, and the judge was like, what, is that not general enough for you? Like he really wasn't willing to entertain their bananas reaction to him. But, uh, but yeah, so this is something that Daniel uh, exposed and uh, it, you know, it, it really did have an effect. Um, you know, there, there are, Oh, another thing that Daniel shares with all of us that we're able to learn is that the government, uh, well, the military is, designating people as EKIA, enemies killed in action, posthumously. And That's that doesn't mean they know that they killed somebody who is a terrorist. It's just how they're marking them. And as far as like whether they're civilians or not, the military would have to invest time and resources into figuring out that those people are 
not terrorism suspects or uh, in order to actually say with certainty that those people who were killed were not innocent. So there's a lot of people who are marked EKI who are not in the civilian casualty counts that we get officially from the U.S. government. And that's because of how they're labeled. So, you know, there'd have to be like a human rights organization that spoke out against the strike, or there would have to be like a village uprising or news coverage that says, hey, a wedding was just bombed or rescuers were attacked and they were trying to save people, you know, and then that would tip off the Pentagon that they probably should go back and mark these people differently. But without any controversy or scandal, you mostly get to leave it as, you know, hey, we think we killed enemies. Yeah, and and in one, another thing that was revealed is in just one five-month period, 90% of the people killed by right. the drone strikes were not the intended targets. Yeah, I mean, that's what I, yeah, that's what I was referring to. Yeah, you know, and I don't know if it happens at that level anymore, but yeah, during that time frame, that really that's stood incredible. out to yeah. to, da to Daniel and and his work. Uh, there's also um, one of the things that he did expose. You know, I don't know a lot about this case, but the very basic detail here, excuse me, is one that is uh, rather stunning. So the UK government revoked the citizenship of someone who was suspected of terrorism. His name was Bilal uh, Burjawi, and they revoked his citizenship. So then he was stateless and the U S government could go ahead and assassinate uh, him in that way. Uh, they wouldn't have to apologize or they wouldn't have to worry about upsetting the British government. So the British government Jesus. washed their hands of any responsibility over what the U S planned to do against Jesus this individual. Christ. Yeah, that's so fucked up. Um, one other thing I found uh, stunning and damning um, is that there were some there was a intelligence surveillance reconnaissance study, an ISR study, at least one. And one, by its own admission, found that killing suspected terrorists, even if they're legitimate targets, further hampers intelligence gathering. And the secret study stated bluntly, quote, kill operations significantly reduce the intelligence available. So you're, you're hurting um, the in intelligence. You're hurting the possibility to gain more and better intelligence by killing these sources of intelligence. I mean, it's just so basic. Um, duh. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but one of the moments that uh, I don't think ever got enough attention during Obama, uh, during his presidency, was how right-wing conservatives were aghast that we could spend so many years under President George W. Bush and it little bit after being outraged, being outraged that the CIA was torturing people. And then President Obama turned around and pioneered and revolutionized this targeted assassination complex where he's actually murdering people from the sky. You know, it's like there was all this, yeah. all this rage that your enhanced interrogation techniques are hurting people. And and you had right-wing conservatives who would say, well, at least when we did it, those people were still alive. And it's like very like crude way of thinking about the subject. And I don't think they're any better than Democrats, but it is incredible that like they were upset. They're, they're, they're opposed to torture. They're opposed to waterboarding. They were willing to go down that route. But hey, if we kill them abroad in these countries in a way that, has never been done before. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. That's yeah. It's nuts. And it traumatized. And I want to bring Daniel Hale back into this. It traumatized him. He writes about in his letter how this is not how he understands combat. And there's there's other drone operators, drone technician people who write very eloquently or speak very powerfully about how. If you are on a battlefield 
and you're physically there, you get to see who that person is that you're facing off with. Are they wearing gear? Um, do they have a weapon? Do they intend to do you harm? Are they actually people who in a war you can be fighting? Or are they the farmers? Are they, you know, just your average villager? Are, who, who are these people? Well, when you're up in the sky with drones and you're not on the ground and you're in some bunker or air base, you have no way of confirming that these people really should be killed or captured. You don't know. You can't tell with drones that these people are actually militants who are fighting the United States. And that's, that's really difficult for people who are in the military involved in doing this to handle, like psychologically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think people think PTSD, how can you get PTSD, you know, if you're not in traditional combat, if you're just, you know, in a bunker operating a video camera, operating a drone, you know, um, it's like, playing a video game, even uh, Hale's colleagues compare it to playing a video game, but it's with real people. And so you, you're seeing people get killed and many people that you don't even know and have to assume, you know, they didn't deserve to be killed. Um, or at, at least one with the conscience might worry about that, that people are getting killed and we don't even know who they are. So, um, so you mentioned specifically one story that made a big change on Hale when his colleagues were watching drone footage for fun, watching people get murdered from drone footage from drones in the sky for fun. Um, I'm going to play a clip from the end of that Code Pink event that mm -hmm. we started earlier where Hale speaks about another specific incident that traumatized him um, and which probably played a role in pushing him towards becoming a whistleblower. I remember this one instance in May and I, I was uh, getting there early and uh, I, I, I took over for an analyst who was fairly new and uh, was unsure of what they were doing um, uh, on this mission. And when I did, it's uh, within a few with, within a, within a, a few minutes, I was able to locate the individual that we were looking for, and um, this individual, who uh, you know, the, all the information we had was that they were a person involved with uh, IEDs and uh, you know manufacturing or distributing IEDs across the country. Um, thank you. Um, and when. When I found them, they were riding their motorcycle uh, up into the mountains. And this is, again, early in the morning, so it was just after morning prayers, and, uh, and the sun was still rising, and um, I was still drinking you know, coffee before uh, we even, haven't even finished my first cup before this all began rather quickly. Uh, and when I found them on their motorcycle, the person that we had been looking for for quite some time, and there had never been an opportunity to kill or capture, um, and my, uh, when, uh, when we found him, he was riding his motorcycle to the mountains, and there was this process ongoing within the, uh, basically the command center, to decide whether or not to, to conduct a strike. Uh, uh, at that point, the individual had eventually met up with um, four other individuals who were um, at a campfire, uh, all, um, all drinking tea, uh, and, and clearly either, you know, there for breakfast or something, something was going on. We weren't quite sure. But in a lot of these instances, when there's somebody that they want bad enough to go after, regardless of whether or not there are other individuals be there beside them at the time at which they would launch an attack, uh, the, the only decision is made is whether or not, you know, they are of age males in order to be basically considered you know, guilty by association. And this was one of those instances. There was, there was only a moment's pause before, um, before they, you know, decided whether or not it was all right to, it was worth it to kill five people for this one person. And that was a fairly easy decision for them to make. Um, 
uh, as far as them being the persons in the room whose job it is to make these final decisions. Uh, okay, thank you. And, uh, and then this is another um, great point he makes. Um, um, I watched this all go on, and it was, wasn't the first time I'd ever experienced a kinetic strike or ever seen this happen, but it was the first time when I kind of sobered up and I realized that I was, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd felt that I could be okay with this and that I, I, could, I, could, I, I, could, I could be a part of this because I felt like I was sincerely protecting American interests and protecting the people of Afghanistan from threats within their country. Uh, but it, it, after that moment when those four other people died, and I have no idea whether or not, you know, they, they, they were, in, they were um, the associates or, or, or just simple bystanders, um, I, I came to quickly realize that I was no longer a part of something that was moral or sane or rational. Um, you know, uh, I, I'll end it on this. I, I distinctly remember during my training, um, someone telling me, uh, explaining to me, because I'd never been overseas before, and, you know, and they explained to me that basically they considered terrorists to be cowards, that they basically, they won't fight face to face, so they plant bombs on the side of the road and wait for soldiers to drive by and, and blow them up, and uh, it was around that time in May after that happened, and I remembered that person, what that person said to me. And I, I couldn't shake the feeling that what was the difference between that and you know the, the little red button on a joystick that has to be pressed to do the same thing, to launch a, the missile from 10,000 miles away. Damn. Damn. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. So that's pretty, pretty heavy. Um, let's see, there's, well, did, is there, do you want to comment on that at all? I mean, it's one, I, I think it's another example of how Daniel Hale is in command of showing us what, you know, it really feels like to feel this trauma because he's, there are statements like that from the sentencing hearing uh, that show that he's he's thinking very clearly about his place in the U.S. Empire. And he's very aware of the role that he was asked to play and how much he regrets performing that role. You know, what I find um, interesting, I found it very interesting to hear that he is related to Nathan Hale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Nathan Hale um, is an American hero. He is celebrated as one of America's first, you know, most important patriots um and a hero for dying uh, and being execute executed for espionage against the british um so just it's just amazing that <laughs> he said the quote by the way when he was in court to the judge i regret that i have what uh, but one life to live yeah and uh, there's just so many levels uh, that makes this interesting. Now, obviously, it's a little different because, <clears throat> uh, you know, in okay, if you are actually committing actual espionage, you can understand why the enemy country would execute you, right? So, but he, but in this case, Daniel Hale was just giving information to the American people information that didn't threaten anybody in any way uh, other than perhaps uh, threaten some possible embarrassment to the government. Um, 
that's and so it's just it really is insane that he's being uh, punished. He was sentenced to nearly four years in prison for sharing this information um, recently, and that's. But nobody was harmed or hurt, and the the courts don't take into account intent at all. Uh, that's that's what's so insane to me. Like, so even if people out there, you know want to defend the drone program and there are some fair arguments you know if if targets really are a real threat to the united states but i don't understand i don't see how anybody can defend throwing a man in prison for sharing information that shouldn't be secret information that the american citizens should know about what their government's doing and how it just makes no sense president barack obama was talking to the public about the drone program and as i said earlier saying things that weren't true so naturally people who are involved should have the free speech rights to speak about what they were observing and then turning around and showing documents to journalists that show that people are being killed who are not militants at an extraordinary rate is something that we should have more of our society should want to protect. There should be more outrage that Daniel Hale is going to prison. And yet it uh, it doesn't get the kind of attention uh, that even, you know, I, I don't want to pit people's cases against each other, but it doesn't even come close to the same attention that we see for Julian Assange's case, you know? So yeah. so we, we really need people to understand that the threats that are perceived against Julian Assange are the same threats that exist in Daniel Hale's case against people who are in government, at, particularly at national security agencies and in the military, but then also as a threat to the press. A lot of this case is anti-journalism. It just was the way that the prosecutors brought it against Daniel Hale, who's a media source. You know, They say things like, well, whether it's true or not, I mean, it's a separate conversation in my view, because the prosecutors are saying things like, oh, well, you're just being, you know, put up to this by a journalist, Daniel Hale. You're, you're, you're being, you know, manipulated into like he, you know, got you to join a you know, little club and give you documents about the secret drone program. And uh, that's that to me, um, you know, talking like that basically treating journalists as if they're like, um, I suppose, espionage act actors or something. I mean, sorry, espionage actors that are challenging uh, the interests of the U.S. is a very alarming that, that you would cast. I mean, the way that Jeremy Scahill is treated in this is one that should bother people, no matter your view of The Intercept, because he is, he is treated as like what he is doing is somehow something nefarious against the United States, even though there is a public benefit to us reading these documents. And so uh, while this is extraordinary that we continue to see this, where you can't have uh, a, an argument about harm, you know, if he had gone to trial, he can't say there was no harm because they say, well, the law's not written that way. It just says that if there was a risk of serious or ex, uh, extremely grave damage or exceptionally grave damage, that then you're guilty. So they don't ever have to produce evidence of harm. They just need to have abstract conversations with the judge or the, the, the bar is so low that all they have to do is have a, an abstract conversation with the judge about what could have happened which in their mind is whatever 
figment of their imagination they can conjure while they're in that courtroom. Yeah. And uh, they tried to put some teeth to it very uh, feebly, uh, desperately by suggesting with secret evidence that there is an internet compilation video, which I don't actually know what that is. I assume it's like a YouTube video or, or whatever, but they claim that there I are... respect internet compilation videos, but maybe I should have let you finish that sentence so we know which kind of compilation it is first. Well, I mean, I just... people know people know I like compilation videos. I'm I anyway. I'm, go ahead. Not <laughs> to dis not to dis you, but it just I I haven't seen it. It seems like a very um, you know it seems like a way to inflate the importance of this video. Anyways, apparently some ISIS. Person, oh god leader. i knew it i knew yeah, it Go yeah, i was leading I you it. into a trap i knew it yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was um it was uh all all my conceived plan to to, to get you to um you know and this is going to be why this video gets docked and removed from from youtube so like i'm sorry i made it that easy for youtube usually they might have to work a little harder but anyways there's this video that they claim exists where uh, in a part to ISIS followers, they mentioned the two documents that oh, Daniel wow. was charged with releasing. Oh. And they say, well, there you go. This shows that this is the risk of damage. And the problem with that, which was called out very, very well by a, a defense person who they, they got, they, they did this really, ex, ex, really great filing from a man named Harry Cooper, who's a former executive expert at the CIA, who was involved in working with classified information and training top officials at the CIA, including the director on how to manage and take care of and protect classified information. And he said, and this is, you know, we need more logic in these cases because, and we need judges that do more to demand logic in these cases, because here's the logic. The logic is, if ISIS had uncovered something that was useful to them in avoiding detection from the U.S. military and it was in Daniel Hale's documents that he released, they would not shoot it, shout it from on high that they have figured this out and they can do what they need to evade the United States. They just wouldn't want to give up that tactical advantage that they had gained. Yeah. So Harry Cooper said, it's more like they're using this as like a trophy. They're saying, Hey, we got these documents. This is like, Whoa, we we've got something that the U S government didn't want us to see, but it doesn't amount to them being able to beat us on the battlefield. Yeah. And it's, it's not what the prosecutors claim, but this was a desperate attempt to try to put something to their case because they have nothing. There is, yeah. you know, and this same guy assessed the documents. He says, you know, these, these documents did not pose the kind of risk that the prosecutors would like us to believe. They just simply didn't. Um, yeah. And so they tried and they really, they, they try to do this. Uh, you know, the last thing I'll just say before letting you back in is that this is a part of the history of the Espionage Act. It goes all the way back to 1917. It's a more than 100 year old law. And when it was first applied or deployed by the US government under President Woodrow Wilson, it was to go after people who were dissenting against World War I and the US's involvement in World War I. So, you see a lot of continuity here that we go from World War I to now, and it's still being used to go after people who speak out against the war. Not at the same rate as back then, but it's still a tool that they're using to go after people who are anti-war. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, oh, so they're pointing out that okay, ISIS is discussing publicly, oh, there was this leak. Yeah, but so is every fucking, <laughs> you know, respectable news organization in the whole fucking world. So are you going to let, you know, are, 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense uh, to, to, for that, that is in any way, you know, significant or proof that th this leak harmed national security. Um, they're I mean, still terrorists... using this. They're still yeah. using this yeah. argument after yeah. they tried it against Chelsea Manning and it failed. Uh, they mm -hmm. accused her of aiding the enemy, um, aiding terrorists. I was at this court martial. I covered it and watched as they were unable to persuade the military judge with a similar argument, saying that because, you know, at the time Osama bin Laden had been alive, and when they raided his compound, they found WikiLeaks documents in his possession. And he had, in fact, asked somebody to get him copies of the WikiLeaks documents, which, again, they did a similar thing just like this video. They're like, oh, he wants to read the documents. He wants to use them. There you go. That's the risk of harm. That's the risk of exceptionally grave damage, except the Internet works in such a way that we <laughs> all have access to these materials. And so if... It's, you know, if it's aiding terrorism to put documents on the Internet, then you know, a lot of us are actually guilty under the Espionage yeah. Act. You know, we yeah, are also, all criminals. We are all criminals in the eyes of this government. And if it's a national security threat to have your documents or your literature in a terrorist bedroom or bookshelf, then fucking everybody, every all those authors of all those books found in Osama bin Laden's compound, you know, belong in jail. I mean, I Bobby, he Bob, read Bob, yeah, he read Bob Woodward. Yes, yeah, Bob getting, Woodward's yeah. Bob Woodward's uh, book was found in Osama bin Laden's compound, and that act and that did absolutely have the most secret material that the U.S. has. The it's it was labeled the highest secrecy label there is bob woodward actually bragged about that you know on a little college lecture tour <laughs> and then it was found in osama bin laden's own bookshelf uh i mean so so that just goes to show that these this argument is so subjectively chosen and just shows that it's complete bullshit because it's never applied across the board it's only applied against people who the government has a beef with and you know whistleblowers who the government wants to vilify um so yeah it's just it's it's it's, it's so funny and so tragic and <laughs> um these cases are always a combination of tragedy and farce i mean there's always yeah. something they're doing that hits a new level of ridiculousness but yet these people have their lives destroyed you know, it's like Daniel Hale lost from 2014 to now and then add three years. He's going to lose 10 years of his life to this political prosecution. So while they are fumbling and bumbling their way like a bunch of idiots through this case, they're also wrecking an honorable person's future and life. Um, and uh you know, I, I will say for those who are, are interested that he's not likely to serve 45 months, it'll be far less. So that's good. And also, uh, the government wanted much more time. They also wanted him to grovel. Uh, there was there was a dirty game they were playing where they wanted him to. So he pled guilty on March 31st to one charge. There were four other Espionage Act charges that the government did not dismiss. So he was taking a gamble that he would get to the sentencing and escape the sentencing, having only been convicted of one offense. And, and he was taking a gamble that he would avoid a trial on those other four charges, which is, which is an aspect of this case that I challenged other mainstream mm. news reporters to include in their coverage, because I think it's important. Daniel Hale had a lot of anxiety and stress when he entered the courtroom earlier this week for his sentencing date on July 27th because he didn't know what was going to happen to those four offenses the night before. You know, he thought, okay, I might find out that I'm going to be sentenced to prison for two or three years. I'm going to start serving that sentence and there could be a trial later on in my future on these other four offenses. Um, so, 
Um, so yeah. Uh, just to give people a, a metaphor, just some comparison to how ridiculous it is that in these whistleblower cases, these Espionage Act cases where people are prosecuted for leaking information and in Assange's case, uh, receiving and publishing information. Think about how intent is handled in other crimes or alleged crimes, right? Uh, other charges. Um, in Espionage Act cases, intent doesn't matter. But in cases where you're dealing with actual murder, like the most serious things of all, it intent is absolutely taken into consideration. You have all these levels of you know manslaughter versus various levels of murder you know it, and it's just absurd that we don't take intent into account on Esp espionage act cases which are huge cases that set huge precedents and I just, anyway, so that's, I, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> well, yeah, the only thing that you have right now is the knowledge. Like people used to think that, okay, there's no intent, but you could possibly get through and ex escape with a lenient sentence because you have to have the knowledge that what you would do would cause harm to U.S. national security or advantage a foreign power or a foreign adversary. But what the U.S. government has very shrewdly done to get around that knowledge requirement is to say someone like Daniel Hale enters the military, receives this training on classified information that we tell him all about how, you know, don't let this get in the hands of journalists because it'll help terrorists. Don't let uh, the don't, don't talk to people. Don't post on social media about drones. Don't, um, you know, uh, be careful. Don't give this to terrorists. You know, uh, sensitivity. You get trained on all the levels. This is secret. This is top secret. And then they sign a non-disclosure agreement, or they take a secrecy oath. And then by doing that, that's the evidence that they know that when they release those materials, they are going to exactly. be risking harm. Even though that's not no, like specifically no, it's not because like Daniel had professional experience with this and he would know if what he was disclosing gave some kind of tactical advantage to people like if it was in real time you know like if you were actually committing espionage you would give it to a militant group on the ground in afghanistan they would turn around and they would launch an attack on a division of u.s troops that would be that's horrible. a real espionage yeah, that would be horrible espionage. yeah and that's what they want us to believe can happen yeah. with these documents but it's yeah. never true it's always a lie and when they make those accusations, yeah, that you're basically accusing them of murder. And yet, you know, in murder, like I said, in murder cases, you actually consider intent. And in this case, doesn't matter at all. Even though, of course, it's not even anything even close to murder. Um, <laughs> um, so let me just read this great uh, quote from Hale that you sent me. He says, and this was in, in court? This is part of his 15-minute statement to the judge and to everyone in attendance. He had supporters uh, from Code Pink and others. Uh, there were um, whistleblowers. There were people who had been prosecuted into the Espionage Act present. John Kiriakou and Thomas Drake were in the courtroom. Oh, and uh, yeah. so, uh, and he delivered this. He, he said this in part of his speech. He said, quote, I am here because I stole something that was never mine to take, precious human life. For that, I was compensated and given a medal. I couldn't keep living in a world in which people pretended that things weren't happening that were. Please, Your Honor, forgive me for taking papers instead of human lives. deep so kevin um i'll let you have the last word um and please don't forget to tell us where we can follow your work 
Yeah. So one thing that we haven't mentioned, but it's incredible to me knowing what I know about Obama's war on whistleblowers is that the defense received a document when they were doing discovery before the trial that showed there was dissent at the National Security Division in the Justice Department. And there were people who were you know, in high positions who didn't want to charge Daniel Hale or refused to put their necks on the line and charge Daniel Hale, which is why he wasn't charged immediately after he was raided. So this, I didn't think that could happen under Obama. But as I process it in my head, I know the kind of negative media attention he received and nicknames President Kill List, uh, Drone Warrior in Chief. Uh, There's a lot of flack he got for that joke. Do you remember about uh, the Jonas Brothers and when he was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner and he talks about how uh, if they take his daughter out and they don't come back home, we might have to send a, a predator drone after them. So it wasn't good. Um, they had a lot of bad reputation. A lot of journalists were upset about how he handled this issue. And so it's possible they didn't want to pursue this case. He also at that time had already prosecuted more people under the Espionage Act than all previous presidents combined. People who had a lot of claim to the, to the label of being whistleblowers. And so it's likely he said, maybe, maybe it was like, we met a quota and we shouldn't do any more of these kinds of cases during the rest of my second term. Whatever the case may be, and we also know he didn't indict Julian Assange officially, although the investigation was not fully uh, formally closed. So this went somewhere and, and Jeff Sessions, Jeff Beauregard Sessions entered as attorney general. And then there was Bill Barr and both, we're willing to do whatever, um, and the people they empowered below them at these divisions were willing to do and cross any boundary, irrespective of freedom of expression, irrespective of press freedom and constitutional rights. And they went forward with indicting Daniel Hale. And so, and they fought aggressively for the harshest of sentences. Uh, they didn't know, by the way, that Daniel Hale's trial would not be completed before Don Donald Trump's second term was over. He was scheduled to go on trial in March 2020, but the pandemic forced that to be postponed. So if this had happened under Trump, um, well, I, I don't know exactly how it would have turned out differently. I actually doubt it would because he ended up being fortunate that he had a judge who seemed to care um, about Daniel and believe that he was a person of conscience, even though he said, I can't, I can't sit here and pretend like you didn't break the law. But uh, he, he believed that Daniel was a person of conscience. And uh, for that, uh, the US government didn't get what they wanted when they when they used their sledgehammer, you know, they really wanted nine to 11 years, and it ended with something less. So as I look forward, as I look forward to Joe Biden's administration and what might lie for future whistleblowers, national security whistleblowers. When I think of the next Daniel Hales or Chelsea Mannings or Edward Snowdens, whoever's going to come forward, you know, I, I think that the media really needs to recognize that this case is attack, an attack on them as well as whistleblowers. So we need to do two things. We need to convince people that Daniel Hale and Edward Snowden and Chelsea and all these people have free speech rights. They should be able to talk to the media about what they go through. And we shouldn't also expect that they can go through proper channels internally and yeah. reveal this information or bring it to Congress. They are not people in any positions of power who members of Congress will listen to. And they also are exposing themselves to retaliation, which they know will happen if they talk to someone in their unit. I mean, Chelsea Manning and Daniel Hale were both deployed abroad. If they object to the drone program or they object to how they're capturing people and threatening them with torture or whatever, they um, are gonna be all alone overseas on a base. 
uh, and vulnerable, extremely vulnerable, if any anyone who's above them decides to do something to them. Uh, so we need to think about them and then the press who were extremely outraged and they deserve to be that Donald Trump's Justice Department was opening investigations and subpoenaing them to find their sources as they were investigating Donald Trump's administration. They need to recognize that those issues are also connected to what we see unfolding in Daniel Hale's case, as well as Julian Assange's case. And if you don't recognize how the Espionage Act is a war on journalism, is part of the war on journalism, then you, you almost deserve what kind of event happens in the future. I mean, you deserve the sort of retaliation or punishment that is going to come down the pike because you weren't willing to step forward and raise your voice against Joe Biden and future presidents who are going to use this law in such a malicious manner. Well, I will thank you for joining me. Thank you for those final statements and if you won't tell everyone, I will tell everyone you they oh. can follow you on Twitter, Shadow Proof. Uh, and um, everyone subscribe here because I'm going to be want to be talking to Kevin in the future, hopefully soon, uh, yeah, and, and cover the Assange case in depth. If Go for it. One thing in, oh, first off, people should know that there's an appeal hearing scheduled now in the Assange case for August 11th. I don't know how many people have got the news, but I imagine people watching your stream are really – tracking that case and want to know what's going to happen next. So the U S government will have their day to challenge the extradition decision on August 11th. Uh, and then I was just going to say, uh, you mentioned shadow proof, but I do my newsletter on whistleblowers at the dissenter.org T H E D I S S E N T E R.org, which is where it's a free letter. You can get the stories I do on whistleblowers and the updates on WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange. So thank you for all this time. I appreciate our conversation. Awesome. Thanks again, Kevin. And thank you all for listening. Have a great night.